if you have ever tried bending a piece of sheet metal around a radius on a bending brake, you know that it's not simple. And uh, one of the things that happens is it doesn't come out correctly, and since most of us hate to be wrong, we need to know about set setback, bend allowance, bend tangent lines, and sight lines. This is going to be a presentation where I'm going to show you where all of those things come from. Now, before I begin, I want to tell you that in theory, the theoretical world exactly agrees with the real world. But in the real world, the theoretical world usually isn't the same as the real world. And unfortunately, most of the time, the difference between what it should theoretically be and what it really is, is bad for us. And we don't like that. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, when we get to sheet metal, some of those differences can be bad for us, but some can be good for us. In theory, and in the real world, things aren't always the same. In theory, the measurement to parts that we're going to form on the brake are made to nice, simple sizes, but in the real world, things become quite complex. In theory, there are sharp angled bends that make it simple to locate the corners, but in the real world, we have to go around a corner because a sharp angle would bend the aluminum, or crack the aluminum. So our theoretical math is nice and simple, but our real world math is complex because of the radius. And uh, the theoretical things that we've talked about are called mold point dimensions, and they're frequently what we get on our blueprints. But in the real world, the real things that happen are what we're going to be dealing with, and they're, oh, we're going to begin the end, bend and end the bend at these mold tangent lines, and we have to calculate where they're going to go. So what does Pac-Man have to do with bending metal? I want you to notice the corners on Pac-Man. Do you notice how abrupt they are? They're like our theoretical metal bends, where something moving one way and then suddenly, bam, we move the other way. But you know that that's very theoretical. And in the real world, corners don't happen that way. Corners are, well, they're round. And it takes a little time to go around the corner. Um, here you can see, well, we're kind of still in the smoke, so you don't see, but we're looking from the top, watch the path the cars take. It's not abrupt. It goes around a radius. And we're going to look at a lot of the same things as we bend our sheet metal around the radius. So, I'm going to use that analogy of the roadway, and we're going to make a bend. We're going to hang a right, right at the first right. So the mold point is the theoretical location of the turn. Here's our turn, and in our theoretical world, we go right up there, and then suddenly we turn. But in, uh, that gives us a mold point, which is right over here, and that mold point is the theoretical point where we make the turn. In the real world, though, we know we begin the turn before we get to the turn, and we end the turn after we get to the turn, and that leads us to the setback. The setback is that distance that we began before we got to the turn, and that we ended after we got to the turn. So that's our setback. Luckily, it's the same number for both cases. The next thing we need to look at is the bend radius. And if you follow the setback lines back to where they intersect, you will find that there's a point, and that point is where we're going to measure our bend radius from. Our bend radius is the distance from that point to the inside of the bend. Last but not least, it's going to take us some material to sweep around the corner, and the amount of material that's required to sweep around the corner is going to be called our bend allowance. Now, here's where that bit about the theoretical and the practical comes in. In the practical world, we find that when we go around the corner like this, we actually cut a little bit off the corner and we get ahead. And that means that the bend allowance is shorter than the theoretical amount of material required to get around the curve. So we can actually bend our piece of metal and it's like we gained a little metal in the bend. That's going to be an important thing to check for later on when we're checking to make sure we're correct. All right, so how do we calculate these? Well, let's start with mold point. If we talk about calculating mold point, we're talking about the wrong thing because we don't calculate mold point. We read the mold point off our blueprints, or perhaps we take the mold point and we read it on a tape measure when we're measuring how big our part should be. We measure it on our aircraft. So that one was easy. Let's move on to the next one. Setback. Okay, for this lecture, I'm going to assume a 90 degree angle, and we can convert this to other angles fairly easily, but let's just stick with the simple right now. Here's our theoretical mold point bend, 
and you'll notice there's our mold point, nice square corner. But in reality, we know we have to bend it around a radius. And I've drawn this circle here, and the radius, of course, is half the distance across the circle. Now, once we know the bend radius, you can look up here and you can see that the amount of setback, which is up here, is going to be equal to the bend radius plus the material thickness. And that gives us the setback. When you see that, we can write that down in a formula where our setback equals our bend radius plus our material thickness. So that's a nice simple formula to remember. If you take the material thickness and the bend radius and put them together, you know how far you need to begin before you reach the corner and how far you need to end after the corner. All right, so continuing along. The bend radius, how do we get our bend radius? Well, again, we don't calculate our bend radius. We actually select a bend radius. And how do we know how to select a bend radius? Well, they may tell us when they tell us to make the part what our bend radius needs to be. But they may not tell us. And if we, they don't tell us, we need to select it on our own. And there are three things that we need to consider ourselves when we go to select it on our own. Number one, we need to consider, we concern ourselves with the fact that it needs to fit. So if I get too big of a uh, bend radius, it may not fit in the position it needs to be. Number two, I need to have the proper radius dies to make that particular corner. And number three, I cannot exceed the minimum safe bend. I can't bend it tighter than the minimum amount that I can do. Over here, you can see that bend radius going on. We'll come back to this diagram in a little bit. Um, so we select our bend radius. Here I've got a minimum safe bend chart. And on this minimum safe bend chart, we can start looking details up. Uh, we are going to be working with 6061 alloy, T6, and so we select this uh, row across here, and then we need to select the column, and on this case, and in this example, we've selected 32 thousandths, and when we go to right where they come together, we find that there is a one-half T to one-and-a-half T allowance for our minimum safe bend. What does that mean? A half of the thickness to one-and-a-half times this thickness. That's how much I can go. So I have to multiply by 0.32 and I find exactly where that's going to come in. This is our minimum safe bend and that is 0.016 to 0.048 is our minimum safe bend. And in that, in that range, if we get down into the really lower parts in between there, then we have to be careful not to crack and inspect our work. As long as we're above 0.048, we're good to make that bend. Now, our particular bend is going to be made at 0.125, and because of that, that's way bigger than the minimum safe bend, and we're good. All right, the last thing we need to talk about is the bend allowance, and the bend allowance is the amount of material we use in the real bend. Now, this one is definitely going to be a calculation for us. So, calculating our bend allowance. And again, this is for a 90 degree bend. Here's our same picture up here, and now we need to see what the bend allowance is going to be. The only thing I've done different about this particular picture, though, is that little dotted line right in the middle. And that little dotted line right in the middle tells us about the, what we call the neutral axis. As we begin bending this metal, metal on the inside here shrinks, and metal on the outside uh, expands or gets stretched, but metal in the middle doesn't. And so our radius across from here to here is our material thickness plus a half, I'm sorry, a half of our material thickness plus our bend radius. Working with that half of material thickness plus our bend radius, that tells us what the radius of the neutral circle is going to be. So if I want to find out what the circumference of the neutral circle is, I need 2 pi times the radius, or 2 times pi times my bend radius plus a half of my material thickness to get me what that whole circle is. But I don't need the whole circumference. How much of the circumference do I need? I need one out of four, or one quarter. So I'm going to simply take that two pi, and I'm gonna stick a four underneath it, and I get two pi over four times the quantity, bend radius plus a half the material thickness. And that gives me my formula for what I'm going to do. But a lot of us don't like all that, that fancy way of expressing it in terms of math. So what we're going to do is we're going to simplify, and by the way, I'm going to give you a little warning here. When I make, give you the simplified version, I'm not actually using exactly half across here. I'm using 0.455 because that turns out to be a little more accurate for our aluminums. The different materials are different. But our formula turns out to be bend allowance equals 0.1, uh, 1.57 times the bend radius plus 0.702 times the material thickness.
and that'll tell us how much material it's going to take to go around the bend. So, we've covered how to do it all, but we don't really do it until we do it, so let's dive in. All right, putting it all together in theory. Here I have a problem, and this happens to be the problem I assigned my students on project number two, where they have a four and a half inch wide spar with three quarter inch deep flanges. So, that's our mold point dimensions, four and a half by three quarters. That's the theoretical part, but we need to build the real part. So I could use the theoretical part and I could lay out four and a half inches, four, I'm sorry, three quarter, four and a half, three quarter, and I would know that six inches would fold this spar. Keep that area, that number in mind while we keep working. By the way, 24 inches long is how wide they have to work. Again, this is our simplified version using mold points, but in real life we don't get to use the simplified version. We have to consider the bend tangents. So our single lines, we're going to have to set back from our single lines, our mold point lines, to form two bend tangent lines. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw these in, and now you can see two bend tangent lines where I, each place where I had a single mold point line. Now I still left the mold point lines in there just so you can see them. Now, I want you to notice that here, for the width of this piece, I need to pull back one setback from my mold point line. And so I can actually calculate that. I know my setback is 0.165 using my formula over here. And so I can take my 3 quarter inch that was over here and subtract one setback from it. And I can find out what value that's going to be. In this case, 0.585. 3 quarters minus one setback, 0.585. Now I come over to here, and in my middle flat, I need you to see that there's one setback from this line and one setback from this line. And so when I put the two of them together, I have to subtract two setbacks, 4.5 minus 0.185. Eight, five, minus 0.185 gives me 4.170 for my center flat. And of course my bottom flat is just the same as my top flat because the math is identical. So now I know what the three flats are, but I don't know what the two bends are yet. So I still don't know what my total amount of material is. Now I have to go in and calculate my bend allowance. And my bend allowance formula was 1.57 times my bend radius plus 0.702 times my material thickness, and I do that and I find a 0 0.224. And my 0 0.224 then goes in as the amount of material used on each of these bends. Now I can add the five pieces together, and when I add the five pieces together, I find 5.788, I've gone ahead and put this in on my diagram, and that 5.788 inches is how much I'm going to need to make this in real life. Remember, my Mold point dimension said it was going to be 6. So this is a little less than it was at my mold point dimension. And this is a good reality check because if you cut the corner a little bit and you come up with a little more than you had before, you're doing something wrong. Check your math, make sure you're coming up with a little less. The sharper or the the uh, more you cut the corners, the less material you're going to need. All right. Now we've got the the, the piece is laid out, but we're still not ready to actually put it in the machine and bend it. And that's because we need to talk about something called the sight line. Here I've got an eye, and my eye is looking down at that material. I need to put my bend tangent line right underneath the radius of my bending break. But the problem is, here's a bend tangent line, another bend tangent line out here. The problem is I can't see where this bend tangent line is because it's underneath there. So I can only see one bend radius away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a material, or add a mark called a sight line, and that sight line is going to be one bend radius away from my bend tangent line. And I'm going to see that from straight above. Now, it doesn't matter which bend tangent line, I decide I want to measure my one bend radius away. But once I decided which one it's going to be, I need to make sure that's the one that's directly underneath here. So I like to add a little X when I measure away from my bend tangent line. I put a little X next to the one it was so I don't forget which one I need to put underneath the jaw, the bending call. Also, let's talk about why we have to look from straight above when we go to do that bend. You need to know that if you look from straight above, here we are. You can see that one bend radius and everything lines up correctly. 
But if I redraw this diagram and I'm not looking from straight above, I want you to notice that the sight line isn't directly underneath anymore, and now I get an error that is uh, a problem. We don't like errors. All right, so I add my sight lines. Here our bend radius is an eighth, so I take this same thing, and I go ahead and I measure one-eighth an inch away, and I'm measuring one-eighth an inch away from the inner ones. As I measure that one-eighth an inch away, I can pull my line here, shown in blue. I can pull that line across, and then I can go ahead and put that little X on each side to show me which one it is, so I can stick this underneath the brake, and I can measure that. Now, the last thing I need to say about all of this is, just like flying a tail dragger, you need to practice. This may have made sense while I talked about it, but unless you've done it a few times, when you go to do this in real life or when you go to take a test and do this if you're a student, it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. So develop quite a few flats. Spend your time doing this, practicing it, and then when it comes time to actually do it in real life, it'll be a whole lot easier.